All right, this is going to be the final unit of the class, uh, and it's on uh, stress, which is a really a core topic in phonology, and it's something that could be a separate class uh, unto itself. Um, but the principles at work in stress-based phonology um, are really quite different than a lot of the other uh, types of dependencies we've seen in the last two semesters. Um, and so I, I tend to present this sort of on its own as a separate thing. Um, that said, I think you'll see some commonalities between other aspects of phonology that we've studied this year um, and stress, but the, the specific principles at work uh, in stress are really quite different um, than a lot of the other types of phonological processes and constraints and uh, generalizations that we've been looking at in these classes. Uh, so let's start with a completely pre-theoretical observation. Um, and this is uh, just the following. A pattern of alternating strong and weak temporal positions forms part of the rhythmic basis of most languages, um, where in general those temporal positions are going to be uh, units headed by vowels. In classical phonological theory, they're likely to be syllables, right? So what does that mean? Well, lots of languages, including English, Spanish, uh, Russian, Ukrainian, uh, many, although not all, of the languages spoken in our classroom um, have some kind of an alternating strong and weak syllable type of system. Um, and this forms part of the rhythmic basis of these languages, where uh, rhythmicity uh, is sometimes defined as an expectation that periodic events in the speech stream will recur in regular succession. Right? So what makes rhythm in language? Well, according to this definition from Abercrombie, uh, it's basically the idea that you can identify repeating types of units in time and that those help guide your expectations about speech. Right? Uh, so with particular reference to stress, there's this principle of rhythmic alternation, and this is again just fleshing out what's in the previous two points. The idea is that languages are rhythmically organized with a propensity for, or a tendency for the regular recurrence of strong and weak elements, we call that alternating prominence, uh, as in a sequence of stressed uh, versus unstressed syllables. So this is a tendency in many languages. We'll see later on that there's lots of possible different kinds of exceptions to it as well, but the basic pattern or the preferred pattern in many languages seems to be one where strong syllables or stressed syllables alternate with weaker syllables or unstressed syllables. So in example number one here, uh, this is a nonsense word uh, from a movie, oh, is it from Mary Poppins? I think it's from Mary Poppins. Um, and it's a super long word uh, that's made up of, well, presumably several different nonsense morphemes in English. Um, and the observation here is that if you just draw out the syllables uh, in this word, and there happens to be, oh, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14 syllables in this nonsense word, uh, the sort of natural pattern or the one that this falls into when this word is coined in English is one where every other syllable is stressed and the ones in between are unstressed. So that's shown in bold type for these sigma um, type notations here. Um, and then the actual uh, phonetic transcription here, I'm marking stress here with these uh, acute accents, which um, in proper IPA should really be reserved for high tone. Uh, but it's just much more convenient to use them for stress. So in most of the material in this handout, I'll be using acute accents like this for primary stress. Um, and later when it becomes relevant, I'll start putting the grave accents, which slope the other way, for secondary stress within a word. Um, so this particular word, uh, you've probably already read it, but it is supercalifragilistic expialidocious. Um, and the observation here is that uh, the first syllable, su, and every other syllable following it, that is, uh, alternating syllables, are strong, while the ones in between them are weak, right? So it's supercala at the beginning, not supercala. Uh, that would be a sort of minimal pair with stress in different locations um, in English. Um, if you have trouble figuring out uh, where the location of stress is in English words, it might help if you try to gesture along while you're speaking. Um, for instance, uh, you might try bumping the table emphatically while you're speaking. Uh, this is going to sound bad on the microphone, so uh, if you're listening in loud headphones, uh, you might want to turn the volume down. So here's my bump, right? and now I'm going to try to bump along uh, with an English sentence, 
Uh, here I am in my son's bedroom trying to record phonology lectures in the middle of a global pandemic. Uh, and what you can hear here is that my fist falls, my pounding on the table, uh, is falling exactly on the stressed element uh, in every phrase, on the most stressed element in those phrases. And this is not because I'm trying extra hard to align my tapping on the table with the stress in my speech. It's because it's almost impossible to align co-speech gestures uh, in any other way in languages that have stress. Uh, it is 100% uh, implicit and natural to align your co-speech gestures with stressed syllables and almost impossible to align them with unstressed syllables. So that's actually one way that you might um, be able to identify stress if you're having trouble hearing it in English. Uh, so yeah, the number one here is just an illustration that as a sort of default uh, with super long words that don't have a ton of internal structure, we tend to stress every other syllable in English. That's definitely a tendency. There are lots and lots of uh, places where that can't work or where it doesn't happen, but as a kind of default uh, probabilistic tendency, we tend to stress every other syllable. Um, Maranuku uh, is said to be much more systematic in this regard, um, and here you can see um, a series of, uh, let's see, uh, <clears throat> two, three, four, five, and uh, six syllable words in Maranuku, um, and there's a generalization that emerges here. So the two syllable word, and, and these are meant to be uh, representative of all of the words in the language that have this syllable count. Maranuku has totally predictable stress, um, and so any two syllable word will be stressed on the first syllable and not the second, as in tidalk, which means saliva. Uh, and similarly, for other counts of syllables, stress is completely predictable, so for three syllables, we get merepet. Four syllables, yangarmata, where you can hear there's a primary stress on the first syllable and a secondary stress on uh, the third syllable here. Uh, five syllables, langkarataiti. Six syllables, wele penemanta, where again we have primary stress in the first syllable, and then every other syllable, alternating syllables for the rest of the word, we get secondary stresses. Um, and this is said to be totally systematic in Maranunku, um, as it is in many Australian languages. There's a, uh, many languages in Australia that have predictable and alternating stress. That said, there are limits even in these languages about exactly how invariant this stress really is. Um, so in most of these languages, the position of stress can be shifted by different kinds of morphological processes. So it's not just that every single word in the language is going to have alternating stress. It's going to depend to some extent on the morphology in the language. But these are, tend to be some of the most regular and predictable stress systems in the world. Um, interestingly here, three is a point of um, sort of exotic uh, stress. It's the only language um, that I've seen reported on in detail uh, where you have so-called ternary stress. So it's, it's uh, very, very common for languages to have binary stress systems where they tend to alternate stressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed in series of two. Kayubava, as the name of the language suggests, uh, tends to organize stresses in sequences of three syllables. And so the recurring pattern here is strong, weak, weak, strong, weak, weak, strong, weak, weak. Um, and this is an Amazonian language. It is uh, apparently polysynthetic, so you can build gigantic words out of uh, more basic roots. Um, and they uh, apparently have fairly predictable stress here that falls in this ternary pattern, which is very unusual, but worth showing because it's uh, part of the typology of stress. So in two syllable words, um, the first syllable is stressed. That would be the first example here, enye, tail but you get above two syllables and what you find is that syllables are organized um, into series of three starting from the end of the word um, and as uh, taking as many sequences of three as it takes to fill the entire rest of the word with stress every third syllable. So I'm going to try to recite these. I'm sure I'll get some of it wrong. Um, here's the three syllable one. Shakahe. You put on a fourth or a fifth syllable onto here and no more stresses are added. It just stays on the third from last syllable. Kihibere, ari uucha. But then you get a sixth syllable in and now all of a sudden you have two series of three um, and you get a secondary stress on the third syllable before the primary stress. Uh, this is something like 
jihira uh, riyama. Again, adding more syllables in doesn't add stresses. Uh, if you just have one or two extras, they get sort of stranded at the edge of the word. Marahaha e iki, iki tapare repeha. And then when you get to nine syllables, um, you get again a third series of three syllables with stress on the initial one. Cha adi robovu ruruche, and so on and so forth. Uh, so that's kayuvava. Um, in general, ternary stress appears to be possible, um, but binary stress, as in English and Maranunku, much more common in the world's languages. Um, so that's uh, some sort of basic properties of stress. What are we talking about when we talk about stress? There's a second question here, which is, why do we need stress? And what I mean here is, why do we need stress in our theory of grammar? What is it doing for us? What are we capturing with this idea of stress? Um, one of the answers, uh, well, in general, the entire part of phonology that studies stress is referred to as metrical phonology, um, because this rhythmic structure is sometimes referred to as metrical, um, as being based on a meter. Uh, and uh, metrical phonology concerns basically phonological patterns that involve some notion of relative prominence, where by far the most common notion of relative prominence that shows up in this field is stress, right? Stressed versus unstressed. Uh, word stress versus phrase stress, phrase stress versus sentence stress. Um, there's various levels of phonological prominence and we refer to most of them as stress. Um, the most straightforward evidence for this prominence is just phonetic. Right? And so uh, this is true of you know the pronunciations I've just been producing in that first section. Um, and uh, also more subtle properties and uh, you know that we have we, we need to actually measure in prot to be sure about but they have been extensively in many languages um, and in many languages vowels in some positions in particular are systematically either longer or more intense or more acoustically peripheral in the vowel space that is think of english that has full vowels and stressed syllables but uh, mostly schwa vowels and the unstressed ones these vowels are more likely to bear pitch accents so pitch movements associated with the head of a phrase um, or all of the above uh, they have some set of these characteristics compared to other vowels right? so that's a phonetic fact about english and many many other languages um, that we're going to need to describe somehow in our theory of phonetics and phonology. Um, and so we refer to these vowels and whatever prosodic units contain them, so syllables for the most part, uh, we're going to refer to those as stressed. Stressed vowels, stressed syllables versus unstressed vowels, unstressed syllables. Um, so that's sort of one set of reasons why we need stress in our theory of phonology. Um, there's a second set of reasons um, that are a little bit uh, more grammatical in nature, and in particular, there's a bunch of phonological generalizations in many languages that can't be stated without reference to stress. Um, so here's an example from uh, Russian, and this is based on um, forms from uh, friends I grew up with in Massachusetts uh, who were, were Russian emigres, but I've been told that this is fairly similar to Moscow Russian. Um, in other areas of Russia, these vowel reduction facts are very, very different, but this is um, one mainstream dialect of Russian. Um, and so the idea here, or not the idea, but what the data is showing us is that in the general case, uh, Russian can contrast low and mid-back vowels, as in tam versus tom. This one means there, and this one means tom, like a book. Um, and yeah, it's minimally contrastive in a stressed syllable. That said, the situation changes when the syllable is not stressed, um, and uh, here we're getting one form of the word windows, uh, the plural of, of window. Um, and it's shown here with stress on the first syllable because I wanted to show you that underlyingly in the lexicon, in the UR, that first vowel in the noun window is an O. So this is Okna. Um, but when you put this morpheme for windows, which doesn't include the last vowel here, you put that morpheme in different contexts and it takes the stress away from that first syllable, when that happens, uh, the O vowel underlyingly changes to A, ah, because in an unstressed syllable, there can't be any O vowels in this variety. So if you take the stress away from Okna from the first syllable, it becomes A, ah, as in this form of the word window, which is the nominative singular, Akno. Not Okno, Akno. Uh, 
uh, you change this to the genitive case, um, and it again uh, shifts the stress to the second vowel off of the first one. And again, instead of being realized faithfully as o, that first vowel comes out a. Ah, so akna. And impossible in this variety of Russian would be an unstressed o vowel. Just doesn't happen. So there are no words like okno. Uh, so what are we seeing here? In general, there's a contrast between a and o, but not in unstressed syllables. In unstressed syllables, there's only a and no o. Uh, so what that means is we're going to need to describe in the phonemic system or the phonological grammar of Russian exactly where these vowel contrasts or where these features are contrastive. Um, and in order to explain where they are and are not contrastive, this is positional neutralization, we're going to need to make reference to stress. So basically, in a stressed syllable, uh, they're contrastive. In the syllable preceding a stress, they are not. Um, and then in other positions relative to stress, the facts get even more complicated. But for now, we'll just limit it to these two positions. Um, another point here, if it were predictable where the stress were going to fall in Russian, phonologically predictable, then whatever the right phonological description is of that context, we could also use that to talk about the vowel neutralization, and that would sort of save us. We wouldn't necessarily need to make any reference to stress in the phonological grammar. We could just say, well, whatever the phonological context where stress occurs, that's also the context where these two vowels are contrastive. Um, this is why I've picked Russian, however. Stress is totally not predictable in Russian. Actually, sorry, that's kind of a lie. It is not predictable in Russian. Uh, it is not totally unpredictable in any language. That is, it's not completely free, but it's certainly not predictable, and it has to be memorized in the lexicon in Russian, right? Uh, and so, uh, in other words, there is no rule constraint or generalization um, that will tell you the phonological context of where stress must occur in Russian. It's arbitrary and lexical for the most part. Um, and that means that explaining where these vowels are contrastive, we're going to need to refer explicitly to stress or maybe to phonetic properties of stress or something like that. But it's going to be importantly tied in with the system of phonological contrasts in this language. Okay, we're 17 minutes in. I'll do one more section here if I have time. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we've already shown you some data from a bunch of different languages. And just like every other phonological phenomenon that we've discussed in this class, um, we need to take a typological view when we look at stress because we don't want to just model a bunch of facts from familiar Indo-European languages. Uh, we want to have some kind of a handle on uh, what aspects of stress are widespread um, and others that aren't, what necessarily holds about stress systems, uh, and so on and so forth. And so the first thing to say from a typological standpoint is that there appear to be many languages around the world uh, that just don't have stress. Um, and then beyond that, there's also languages uh, where people argue uh, back and forth about whether this language does or doesn't have stress, but it's uncontroversial that there are languages out there without uh, stress at all, as far as we can tell. Um, and then within languages that have stress, there are uh, a couple big uh, categorical distinctions between different kinds of stress languages that are super important when we're thinking about the properties uh, of different languages. Um, so one of these is the fixed versus free stress uh, <coughs> distinction. Um, and this is related to the meat and potatoes of everything we've done in phonology so far. Uh, it's basically referring to the predictability or unpredictability in phonological terms of where stress occurs. Uh, so in fixed stress languages, uh, stress is completely predictable. That would include Maranunku that we looked at earlier in the handout. Um, where does stress occur in Maranunku? It, it occurs on the first syllable of a word and every other syllable thereafter first, third, fifth, and so on. Um, completely predictable, doesn't need to be stored in the lexicon, and isn't contrastive. If for it to be contrastive, you'd have to have words that don't have stress on the first, third, and fifth syllables. And amongst syllables with at least, uh, words with at least five syllables, there are no such words in Maranuku. Similarly, Kayuvava, completely predictable. Um, and this contrasts with so-called free stress languages, where stress is simply not entirely predictable. Right? 
um, and it has to be lexically memorized. So Russian was the example I gave above. Um, and uh, Russian is one of the clearest languages I know of where it is completely clear um, that stress needs to be in the lexicon and is somewhat arbitrary. So that said, um, this is not really a contrast between completely predictable stress and completely unpredictable stress. As I mentioned earlier when I was talking about Russian, uh, even in the so-called unpredictable stress languages, um, stress is not entirely free. It's not totally unpredictable. There are always some kinds of tendencies and generalizations and constraints on where stress can appear, even where it's lexically contrastive. Um, right? So, um, for instance, in Tagalog, which is the uh, most widely spoken language in the Philippines, it's an Austronesian language, um, stress is not completely predictable. You can't look at a word, at the segments in the word, and say, oh, I know exactly where the stress is going to be in this word. It's not, in the general case, possible. But it is limited to only a certain number of positions in the word. So in Tagalog, uh, one of the final two syllables is almost always stressed, um, and maybe occasionally uh, you get the third from last syllable, but which one of those is going to be stressed is unpredictable. And I would encourage you to ask yourselves uh, is, uh, to what extent this is like languages you know. So if you're an English speaker, is stress completely free in English? And if you're a Spanish speaker, is stress completely free in Spanish? Take a moment and think about that. Uh, the answer is no for both languages. Uh, in English, it's clearly the case that, that stress is contrastive. We have minimal pairs like present and present and things like that. Um, but that said, just like in Tagalog, uh, in English, stress is almost always on one of the three last syllables of a word. Uh, there are no words that I can think of that have three unstressed syllables at the end of them. Um, in Spanish, similarly, uh, stress is actually closer to fully predictable in Spanish uh, because the vast majority of all words have second to last or penultimate stress in Spanish. But that said, there's a significant residue of words in Spanish uh, that have either uh, third from last, which is called anti-penultimate stress, um, or final stress. To make things even more confusing in Spanish, some of the words with final stress have it in a predictable location. Basically, certain word final consonants in Spanish uh, attract final stress, but not all of the words with final stress actually have those final consonants. So sometimes it's unpredictable and sometimes it's predictable. Um, so Spanish is certainly closer to predictable stress than English is, but it's still not fully predictable. And in fact, the writing system, the orthography in Spanish reflects this uh, in that if you don't put any special marks in a written word, uh, it receives either default penultimate stress, second from last, or default final stress, depending on the presence of a final consonant. Uh, but if you have a word with stress that doesn't conform to the general patterns, the default patterns, for instance, one with exceptional third from last or anti-penultimate stress, you have to make a mark, an accent above that word in the writing system, precisely because stress in Spanish is almost entirely predictable, but not quite. Uh, so that's a big distinction between uh, fixed or uh, predictable or non-contrastive stress and free or unpredictable or contrastive stress. Um, and then stress itself has a number of formal properties that are thought to be important in phonology because we're going to need to make a theoretical model of how this works, and we want it to capture these aspects of stress. Right? Uh, the first one is referred to as culminativity, and it's the idea that each word or phrase or whatever kind of prosodic unit you can think of has a single strongest syllable bearing main stress. Right? So we don't have co-equal uh, syllables that are sort of equally stressed. We have one syllable in a word that has the main word stress, and all the other syllables don't have the main word stress, even the ones that might have some other level of stress. Um, now, there are exceptions, again, in both directions to this. So there are uh, many grammatical words, short function words, that are often exempt from this, um, as in English articles like the, which is almost never stressed in regular speech. Um, and then there's at least one language, Yedin, which is a, an Australian language, 
uh, that's claimed to have multiple stresses in a long word that are equal in prominence. So it's possible that Yedin is an exception to this culminativity property, but there does seem to be something quite widespread and real about culminativity as a property of stress. Uh, rhythmicity is what we started off here, um, which is the idea that syllables bearing equal levels of stress tend to occur spaced at roughly equal distance, falling into alternating patterns. And this is what we started out with. We saw there um, a bunch of binary patterns. We saw one ternary pattern, which is rare but possible. Quaternary patterns, where you stress every fourth syllable, uh, to the best of my knowledge, are unattested. Uh, and then this one is an interesting one. Stress is said to be hierarchical. So most stress languages have multiple degrees of stress, primary, secondary, tertiary. Um, and hierarchical here just means that uh, if you're a main stress, if you're stressed at a higher level, then you're sort of receiving that stress at every level underneath as well. Right? So you're building up stresses um, from the lowest level up to the highest level of the sentence or of the, the prosodic phrase. Um, and every stress at a higher level has to also be a stress at the lower level. So a phrasal stress in English has to also be the head stress of a word. Um, and in theories where there are smaller units uh, than words that are uh, home to stresses, like prosodic feet would be a common one in English, uh, then those same stress syllables need to be heads or stresses of prosodic feet as well. Um, so the picture that this gives of how stress works um, is what Lieberman and Prince call a hierarchy of intersecting periodicities, where the idea is that at some level, say the syllable, you know, every other syllable is going to have some level of stress. And then at the word level, uh, you know, every uh, word is going to have one of those syllable stresses that's also the main stress of the word. So it's like you're laying on an additional level of strong, weak, strong, weak, on top of the syllable level, strong, weak, strong, weak. And then within phrases, one of those word stresses is going to be the highest level stress in the phrase. And so you're putting on an additional layer of strong, weak, strong, weak, strong, weak at the phrasal level. Uh, and what this is like, it's like piling a bunch of um, alternating waves on top of one another, where one of them is moving very fast at the syllable level, strong, weak, strong, weak, strong, weak. Uh, at the word level, you're getting um, one main stress and then a bunch of weaker ones and then another main one in the next word and then a bunch of weaker ones and then even at the phrasal, phrasal level you're getting one main stress of the phrase followed by some word stresses that are not main phrasal stresses followed by the next phrase where you'll have another strong one. So this is what is meant by hierarchical. Um, and the formalism that we're going to use in this section from the Hayes textbook uh, does not capture all of these properties of stress systems perfectly, um, but it is a nice entry into the world of stress and it doesn't require a huge amount of uh, training on different kinds of formal systems. Um, and so I, I do like to use this Hayes one from the textbook. It's also very, very clear, whereas um, these more hierarchical theories of stress that I might gesture at in here are much di more difficult to understand. So we're going to use the Hayes system here. Um, and I'll split that out into a separate lecture.